This is section 65 of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography. Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 65. A Contract with Elisha Bliss, Jr. He returned to Washington without seeing Miss Langdon again, though he would seem to have had permission to write friendly letters. A little later, it was on the evening of January 9th, he lectured in Washington, on very brief notice indeed. The arrangement for his appearance had been made by a friend during his absence. A friend, Clemens declared afterward, not entirely sober at the time. To his mother he wrote, I scared up a doorkeeper, and was ready at the proper time, and by pure good luck a tolerably good house assembled, and I was saved. I hardly knew what I was going to talk about, but it went off in splendid style. The title of the lecture delivered was The Frozen Truth more truth in the title than in the lecture, according to his own statement. What it dealt with is not remembered now. It had to do with the Quaker City trip, perhaps, and it seems to have brought a financial return which was welcome enough. Subsequently he delivered it elsewhere, though just how far the tour extended cannot be learned from the letters, and he had but little memory of it in later years. There was some further correspondence with Bliss, then about the 21st of January, 1868. Clemens made a trip to Hartford to settle the matter. Bliss had been particularly anxious to meet him personally, and was a trifle disappointed with his appearance. Mark Twain's traveling costume was neither new nor neat, and he was smoking steadily a pipe of power. His general make-up was hardly impressive. Bliss's disturbance was momentary. Once he began to talk, the rest did not matter. He was the author of those letters, and Bliss decided that personally he was even greater than they. The publisher, confined to his home with illness, offered him the hospitality of his household. Also he made him two propositions. He would pay him ten thousand dollars cash for his copyright, or he would pay five percent royalty which was a fourth more than Richardson had received. He advised the latter arrangement. Clemens had already taken advice and had discussed the project a good deal with Richardson. The ten thousand dollars was a heavy temptation, but he withstood it and closed on the royalty basis. The best business judgment I ever displayed, he was wont to declare. A letter written to his mother and sister near the end of this Hartford stay is worth quoting pretty fully here for the information and character it contains. It bears date of January 24th. This is a good week for me. I stopped in the Herald office as I came through New York to see the boys on the staff and young James Gordon Bennett asked me to write twice a week, impersonally, for the Herald, and said if I would I might have full swing, and about anybody, and everything I wanted to. I said I must have the very fullest possible swing, and he said all right. I said it's a contract, and that settled that matter. I'll make it a point to write one letter a week anyhow. But the best thing that has happened is here. This great American publishing company kept on trying to bargain with me for a book till I thought I would cut the matter short by coming up for a talk. I met Henry Ward Beecher in Brooklyn, and with his usual whole-souled way of dropping his own work to give other people a lift when he gets a chance, he said, Now, here, you are one of the talented men of the age. Nobody is going to deny that. But in matters of business, 
I don't suppose you know more than enough to come in when it rains. I'll tell you what to do and how to do it. And he did. And I listened well, and then came up here and made a splendid contract for a Quaker City book of five or six hundred large pages with illustrations, the manuscript to be placed in the publisher's hands by the middle of July. The contract was not a formal one. There was an exchange of letters agreeing to the terms, but no joint document was drawn until October 16, 1868. My percentage is to be a fourth more than that they have ever paid any author except Greeley. Beecher will be surprised, I guess, when he hears this. These publishers get off the most tremendous editions of their books you can imagine. I shall write to the Enterprise and Alta every week, as usual, I guess, and to the Herald twice a week, occasionally to the Tribune and the magazines. I have a stupid article in The Galaxy just issued, but I am not going to write to this and that and the other paper any more. I have had a tip-top time here for a few days, guest of Mr. John Hooker's family, Beecher's relatives, in a general way of Mr. Bliss also, who is head of the publishing firm. Puritans are mighty straight-laced, and they won't let me smoke in the parlor, but the Almighty don't make any better people. I have to make a speech at the annual Herald dinner on the 6th of May. So the book, which would establish his claim to a peerage in the literary land, was arranged for, and it remained only to prepare the manuscript, a task which he regarded as not difficult. He had only to collate the Alta and Tribune letters, edit them, and write such new matter as would be required for completeness. Returning to Washington, he plunged into work with his usual terrific energy, preparing the copy. In the meantime, writing newspaper correspondence and sketches that would bring immediate return. In addition to his regular contributions, he entered into a syndicate arrangement with John Swinton, brother of William Swinton, the historian, to supply letters to a list of newspapers. I have written seven long newspaper letters and a short magazine article in less than two days, he wrote home, and by the end of January he had also prepared several chapters of his book. The San Francisco postmastership was suggested to him again, but he put the temptation behind him. He refers to this more than once in his home letters, and it is clear that he wavered. Judge Field said if I wanted the place he could pledge me the President's appointment, and Senator Corners said he would guarantee me the Senate's confirmation. It was a great temptation, but it would render it impossible to fill my book contract, and I had to drop the idea, and besides I did not want the office. He made this final decision when he heard that the chief editor of the Alta wanted the place, and he now threw his influence in that quarter. I would not take ten thousand dollars out of a friend's pocket, he said. But then suddenly came the news from Goodman that the Alta publishers had copyrighted his Quaker City letters and proposed getting them out in a book to reimburse themselves still further on their investment. This was sharper than a serpent's tooth. Clemens got confirmation of the report by telegraph. By the same medium he protested, but to no purpose. Then he wrote a letter and sat down to wait. He reported his troubles to Orion. I have made a superb contract for a book, and have prepared the first ten chapters of the sixty or eighty, but 
I will bet it never sees the light. Don't you let the folks at home hear that. That thieving Alta copyrighted the letters, and now shows no disposition to let me use them. I have done all I can by telegraph, and now await the final result by mail. I only charge them for fifty letters, what even in greenbacks would amount to less than two thousand dollars, intending to write a good deal for high-priced eastern papers, and now they want to publish my letters in book form themselves to get back that pitiful sum. Orion was by this time back from Nevada, setting type in St. Louis. He was full of schemes, as usual, and his brother counsels him freely. Then he says, We chase phantoms half the days of our lives. It is well if we learn wisdom even then, and save the other half. I am in for it. I must go on chasing them until I marry. Then I am done with literature and all other bosh, that is, literature wherewith to please the general public. I shall write to please myself, then. He closes by saying that he rather expects to go with Anson Burlingame on the Chinese embassy. Clearly he was pretty hopeless as to his book prospects. His first meeting with General Grant occurred just at this time. In one of his home letters he mentions, rather airily, that he will drop in some day on the general for an interview, and at last, through Mrs. Grant, an appointment was made for a Sunday evening when the general would be at home. He was elated with the prospect of an interview, but when he looked into the imperturbable, square, smileless face of the soldier, he found himself, for the first time in his life, without anything particular to say. Grant nodded slightly and waited. His caller wished something would happen. It did. His inspiration returned. General, he said, I seem to be a little embarrassed, are you? That broke the ice. There were no further difficulties. Mark Twain has variously related this incident. It is given here in accordance with the letters of the period. End of chapter 65 A Contract with Elisha Bliss, Jr. Read by John Greenman This is section 66 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography Volume One, Part Two, eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five. Chapter sixty six Back to San Francisco. Reply came from the Alta, but it was not promising. It spoke rather vaguely of prior arrangements and future possibilities. Clemens gathered that under certain conditions he might share in the profits of the venture. There was but one thing to do. He knew those people, some of them. Colonel McComb, and Mr. McCrellish intimately. He must confer with them in person. He was weary of Washington, anyway. The whole pitiful machinery of politics disgusted him. In his notebook he wrote, "'Whiskey is taken into the committee rooms, in demijohns, and carried out in demagogues.' And in a letter, "'This is a place to get a poor opinion of everybody in. There are some pitiful intellects in this Congress. There isn't one man in Washington in civil office who has the brains of Anson Burlingame, and I suppose if China had not seized and saved his great talents to the world, this government would have discarded him when his time was up. Anson Burlingame had by this time become China's special ambassador to the nations. Furthermore, he was down on the climate of Washington. He decided to go to San Francisco and see those Alta thieves 
face to face. Then, if a book resulted, he could prepare it there among friends. Also, he could lecture. He had been anxious to visit his people before sailing, but matters were too urgent to permit delay. He obtained from Bliss an advance of royalty and took passage, by way of Aspinwall, on the side-wheel steamer Henry Chauncey, a fine vessel for those days. The name of Mark Twain was already known on the Isthmus, and when it was learned he had arrived on the Chauncey, a delegation welcomed him on the wharf, and provided him with refreshments and entertainment. Mr. Tracy Robinson, a poet, long a resident of that southern land, was one of the group. Beyond the Isthmus, Clemens fell in again with his old captain, Ned Wakeman, who during the trip told him the amazing dream that in due time would become Captain Stormfield's visit to heaven. He made the first draft of this story soon after his arrival in San Francisco, as a sort of travesty of Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Gates ajar, then very popular. Clemens then and later had a high opinion of Captain Ned Wakeman's dream, but his story of it would pass through several stages before finally reaching the light of publication. Mr. John P. Vollmer, now of Lewiston, Idaho, a companion of that voyage, writes of a card game which took place beyond the isthmus. The notorious crippled gambler Smithy figured in it, and it would seem to have furnished the inspiration for the exciting story in Chapter 36 of the Mississippi book. In San Francisco matters turned out as he had hoped. Colonel McComb was his staunch friend. McCrellish and Woodward, the proprietors, presently conceded that they had already received good value for the money paid. The author agreed to make proper acknowledgments to the Alta in his preface, and the matter was settled with friendliness all around. The way was now clear, the book assured. First, however, he must provide himself with funds. He delivered a lecture with the Quaker City excursion as his subject. On the 5th of May he wrote to Bliss, I lectured here on the trip the other night, over one thousand six hundred in gold in the house, every seat taken and paid for before night. He reports that he is steadily at work and expects to start east with the completed manuscript about the middle of June. But this was a miscalculation. Clemens found that the letters needed more preparation than he had thought. His literary vision and equipment had vastly altered since the beginning of that correspondence. Some of the chapters he rewrote, others he eliminated entirely. It required two months of fairly steady work to put the big manuscript together. Some of the new chapters he gave to Bret Hart for the Overland Monthly, then recently established. Hart himself was becoming a celebrity about this time. His Luck of Roaring Camp and The Outcasts of Poker Flat, published in early numbers of the Overland, were making a great stir in the East, arousing there a good deal more enthusiasm than in the magazine office or the city of their publication. That these two friends, each supreme in his own field, should have entered into their heritage so nearly at the same moment is one of the many seemingly curious coincidences of literary history. Clemens now concluded to cover his lecture circuit of two years before. He was assured that it would be throwing away a precious opportunity not to give his new lecture to his old friends. The result justified that opinion. At Virginia, at Carson, and elsewhere, he was received like a returned conqueror. He might have been accorded a Roman triumph had there been time and paraphernalia. Even the robbers had reformed, and entire safety was guaranteed him on the divide between Virginia and Gold Hill. At Carson he called on Mrs. Curry, as in old days, and among other things told her how snow from the Lebanon mountains is brought to Damascus on the backs of camels. Sam, she said, that's just one of your yarns and if you tell it in your lecture tonight, I'll get right up and say so. But he did tell it, for it was a fact, and though Mrs. Curry did not rise to deny it, she shook her finger at him in a way he knew. He returned to San Francisco and gave one more lecture, the last he would ever give in California. His preparatory advertising for that occasion was wholly unique. 
characteristic of him to the last degree. It assumed the form of a handbill of protest, supposed to have been issued by the foremost citizens of San Francisco, urging him to return to the States without inflicting himself further upon them. As signatures he made free with the names of prominent individuals, followed by those of organizations, institutions, various benevolent societies, citizens on foot and horseback, and fifteen hundred in the steerage. Following this, on the same bill, was his reply, to the fifteen hundred and others, in which he insisted on another hearing. I will torment the people if I want to. It only costs the people one dollar apiece. And if they can't stand it, what do they stay here for? My last lecture was not as fine as I thought it was, but I have submitted this discourse to several able critics, and they have pronounced it good. Now, therefore, why should I withhold it? He promised positively to sail on the 6th of July if they would let him talk just this once. Continuing, the handbill presented a second protest, signed by the various clubs and business firms, also others bearing variously the signatures of the newspapers and the clergy, ending with the brief word, You had better go. Yours, Chief of Police. All of which drollery concluded with his announcement of a place and date of his lecture, with still further gaiety at the end. Nothing short of a seismic cataclysm, an earthquake, in fact, could deter a San Francisco audience after that. Mark Twain's farewell address, given at the Mercantile Library, July 2, 1868, doubtless remains today the leading literary event in San Francisco's history. Copy of the lecture, announcement, complete, will be found in Appendix H at the end of last volume. He sailed July 6th by the Pacific Mail Steamer Montana to Acapulco, caught the Henry Chauncey at Aspinwall, reached New York on the 28th, and a day or two later had delivered his manuscript at Hartford. But a further difficulty had arisen. Bliss was having troubles himself this time with his directors. Many reports of Mark Twain's new book had been traveling the rounds of the press, some of which declared it was to be irreverent, even blasphemous in tone. The title selected, The New Pilgrim's Progress, was in itself a sacrilege. Hartford was a conservative place. The American Publishing Company directors were of orthodox persuasion. They urged Bliss to relieve the company of this impending disaster of heresy. When the author arrived, one or more of them labored with him in person without avail. As for Bliss, he was staunch. He believed in the book thoroughly from every standpoint. He declared if the company refused to print it, he would resign the management and publish the book himself. This was an alarming suggestion to the stockholders. Bliss had returned dividends, a boon altogether too rare in the company's former history. The objectors retired and were heard of no more. The manuscript was placed in the hands of Fay and Cox, illustrators, with an order for about 250 pictures. Fay and Cox turned it over to True Williams, one of the well-known illustrators of that day. Williams was a man of great talent, of fine imagination and sweetness of spirit, but it was necessary to lock him in a room when industry was required, with nothing more exciting than cold water as a beverage. Clemens himself aided in the illustrating by obtaining of Moses S. Beach photographs from the large collection he had brought home. End of chapter 66. Back to San Francisco. Read by John Greenman. This is section 67 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography. Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 67. A Visit to Elmira. Meantime he had skillfully obtained a renewal of the invitation to spend a week in the Langdon home. He meant to go by a fast train, but, with his natural gift for misunderstanding timetables, of course took a slow one, 
telegraphing his approach from different stations along the road. Young Langdon concluded to go down the line as far as Waverly to meet him. When the New York train reached there, the young man found his guest in the smoking car, travel-stained and distressingly clad. Mark Twain was always scrupulously neat and correct of dress in later years, but in that earlier day neatness and style had not become habitual and did not give him comfort. Langdon greeted him warmly, but with doubt. Finally he summoned courage to say hesitatingly, "'You've uh, got uh, some other clothes, haven't you?' The arriving guest was not in the least disturbed. "'Oh, yes,' he said with enthusiasm. "'I've got a fine brand-new outfit in this bag, all but a hat. It will be late when we get in, and I won't see anyone tonight. You won't know me in the morning. We'll go out early and get a hat." This was a large relief to the younger man, and the rest of the journey was happy enough. True to promise, the guest appeared at daylight correctly, even elegantly clad, and an early trip to the shops secured the hat. A gay and happy week followed, a week during which Samuel Clemens realized more fully than ever that in his heart there was room for only one woman in all the world, Olivia Langdon, Livy as they all called her, and as the day of departure drew near it may be that the gentle girl had made some discoveries too. No word had passed between them. Samuel Clemens had the old-fashioned southern respect for courtship conventions, and for what, in that day at least, was regarded as honor. On the morning of the final day he said to young Langdon, "'Charlie, my week is up, and I must go home.' The young man expressed a regret which was genuine enough, though not wholly unqualified. His older sister, Mrs. Crane, leaving just then for a trip to the White Mountains, had said, "'Charlie, I am sure Mr. Clemens is after our Livy. You mustn't let him carry her off before our return.' The idea was a disturbing one. The young man did not urge his guest to prolong his visit. He said, "'We'll have to stand it, I guess, but you mustn't leave before tonight. "'I ought to go by the first train,' Clemens said gloomily. "'I am in love.' in what? In love with your sister, and I ought to get away from here." The young man was now very genuinely alarmed. To him Mark Twain was a highly gifted, fearless, robust man, a man's man, and as such altogether admirable, lovable. But Olivia, Livy, she was to him little short of a saint. No man was good enough for her certainly not this adventurous soldier of letters from the West. Delightful he was beyond doubt, adorable as a companion, but not a companion for Livy. "'Look here, Clemens,' he said, when he could get his voice. "'There's a train in half an hour. I'll help you catch it. Don't wait till tonight. Go now.' Clemens shook his head. "'No, Charlie,' he said in his gentle drawl. I want to enjoy your hospitality a little longer. I promise to be circumspect, and I'll go tonight." That night after dinner, when it was time to take the New York train, a light two-seated wagon was at the gate. The coachman was in front, and young Langdon and his guest took the back seat. For some reason the seat had not been locked in its place, and when, after the goodbyes, the coachman touched the horse, it made a quick spring forward, and the back seat, with both passengers, described a half-circle and came down with force on the cobbled street. Neither passenger was seriously hurt. Clemens not at all, only dazed a little for a moment. Then came an inspiration. Here was a chance to prolong his visit. Evidently it was not intended that he should take that train. When the Langdon household gathered around with restoratives, he did not recover too quickly. He allowed them to support or carry him into the house, and place him in an armchair, and apply remedies. The young daughter of the house especially showed anxiety and attention. This 
was pure happiness. He was perjuring himself, of course, but they say Jove laughs at such things. He recovered in a day or two, but the wide hospitality of the handsome Langdon home was not only offered now, it was enforced. He was still there two weeks later, after which he made a trip to Cleveland to confide in Mrs. Fairbanks how he intended to win Livy Langdon for his wife. End of chapter 67 A Visit to Elmira Read by John Greenman This is section 68 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 68 The Reverend Joe Twitchell. He returned to Hartford to look after the progress of his book. Some of it was being put into type, and with his mechanical knowledge of such things, he was naturally interested in the process. He made his headquarters with the Blisses, then living at 821 Asylum Avenue, and read proof in a little upper room, where the lamp was likely to be burning most of the time, where the atmosphere was nearly always blue with smoke and the window-sill full of cigar-butts. Mrs. Bliss took him into the quiet social life of the neighborhood, to small church receptions, society gatherings, and the like, all of which he seemed to enjoy most of the dwellers in that neighborhood were members of the asylum hill congregational church then recently completed all but the spire it was a cultured circle well off in the world's goods its male members for the most part concerned in various commercial ventures the church stood almost across the way from the bliss home and mark twain with his picturesque phrasing referred to it as the stub-tailed church on account of its abbreviated spire also, later, with a knowledge of its prosperous membership, as the Church of the Holy Speculators. He was at an evening reception in the home of one of its members when he noticed a photograph of the unfinished building framed and hanging on the wall. "'Why, yes,' he commented, in his slow fashion, "'this is the Church of the Holy Speculators.' "'Shh!' cautioned Mrs. Bliss. "'Its pastor is just behind you. "'He knows your work and wants to meet you.' "'Turning, she said, "'Mr. Twitchell, this is Mr. Clemens. "'Most people know him as Mark Twain.' "'And so, in this casual fashion, "'he met the man who was presently "'to become his closest personal friend and counselor, "'and would remain so for more than forty years. "'Joseph Hopkins Twitchell, was a man about his own age, athletic and handsome, a student and a devout Christian, yet a man familiar with the world, fond of sports, with an exuberant sense of humor, and a wide understanding of the frailties of humankind. He had been port waste oar at Yale, and had left college to serve with General Dan Sickles as a chaplain who had followed his duties not only in the camp, but on the field. Mention has already been made of Mark Twain's natural leaning toward ministers of the gospel, and the explanation of it is easier to realize than to convey. He was hopelessly unorthodox, rankly rebellious as to creeds. Anything resembling cant or the curtailment of mental liberty roused only his resentment and irony. Yet something in his heart always warmed toward any laborer in the vineyard, and if we could put the explanation into a single sentence, perhaps we might say it was because he could meet them on that wide, common ground sympathy with mankind. Mark Twain's creed, then and always, may be put into three words, liberty, justice, humanity. It may be put into one word, humanity. Ministers always loved Mark Twain, they did not always approve of him, but they adored him. The Reverend Mr. Rising of the Comstock was an early example of his ministerial friendships, and we have seen that Henry Ward Beecher cultivated his company. In a San Francisco letter of two years before, Mark Twain wrote his mother, thinking it would please her, I am as thick as thieves with the Reverend Strebens, 
I am laying for the Rev. Scudder and the Rev. Dr. Stone. I am running on preachers now all together, and I find them gay." So it may be that his first impulse toward Joseph Twitchell was due to the fact that he was a young member of that army whose mission is to comfort and uplift mankind. But it was only a little time till the impulse had grown into a friendship that went beyond any profession or doctrine, a friendship that ripened into a permanent admiration and love for Joe Twitchell himself, as one of the noblest specimens of his race. He was invited to the Twitchell home, where he met the young wife, and got a glimpse of the happiness of that sweet and peaceful household. He had a neglected, lonely look, and he loved to gather with them at their fireside. He expressed his envy of their happiness, and Mrs. Twitchell asked him why, since his affairs were growing prosperous, he did not establish a household of his own. Long afterward, Mr. Twitchell wrote, Mark made no answer for a little, but, with his eyes bent on the floor, appeared to be deeply pondering. Then he looked up and said slowly, in a voice tremulous with earnestness, with what sympathy he was heard may be imagined, I am taking thought of it. I am in love beyond all telling with the dearest and best girl in the whole world. I don't suppose she will marry me. I can't think it possible. She ought not to. But if she doesn't, I shall be sure that the best thing I ever did was to fall in love with her, and proud to have it known that I tried to win her." It was only a brief time until the Twitchell fireside was home to him. He came and went, and presently it was Mark and Joe, as by and by it would be Livy and Harmony, and in a few years Uncle Joe and Uncle Mark, Aunt Livy and Aunt Harmony, and so would remain until the end. End of chapter 68 The Reverend Joe Twitchell Read by John Greenman This is section 69 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 69 A Lecture Tour James Redpath, proprietor of the Boston Lyceum Bureau, was the leading lecture agent of those days, and controlled all, or nearly all, of the platform celebrities. Mark Twain's success at the Cooper Union the year before had interested Redpath. He had offered engagements then and later, but Clemens had not been free for the regular circuit. Now there was no longer a reason for postponement of a contract. Redpath was eager for the new celebrity, and Clemens closed with him for the season of 1868-9. With his new lecture, The Vandal Abroad, he was presently earning a hundred dollars and more a night, and making most of the nights count. This was affluence indeed. He had become suddenly a person of substance, an associate of men of consequence, with a commensurate income. He could help his mother lavishly now, and he did. His new lecture was immensely popular. It was a resume of the Quaker City letters, a foretaste of the book which would presently follow. Wherever he went he was hailed with eager greetings. He caught such drifting exclamations as, "'There he is! There goes Mark Twain!' People came out on the street to see him pass. That marvelous miracle which we variously call notoriety, popularity, fame, had come to him. In his notebook he wrote, fame is a vapor popularity an accident the only earthly certainty oblivion the newspapers were filled with enthusiasm both as to his matter and method his delivery was described as a long monotonous drawl with the fun invariably coming in at the end of a sentence after a pause his appearance at this time is thus set down. 
mark twain is a man of medium height about five feet ten sparsely built with dark reddish-brown hair and mustache his features are fair his eyes keen and twinkling he dresses in scrupulous evening attire in lecturing he hangs about the desk leaning on it or flirting around the corners of it then marching and countermarching in the rear of it he seldom casts a glance at his manuscript no doubt this fairly presents mark twain the lecturer of that day it was a new figure on the platform a man with a new method as to his manuscript the item might have said that he never consulted it at all he learned his lecture what he consulted was merely a series of hieroglyphics a set of crude pictures drawn by himself suggestive of the subject matter underneath new head certain columns represented the parthenon the sphinx meant egypt and so on his manuscript lay there in case of accident but the accident did not happen a number of his engagements were in the central part of new york at points not far distant from elmira he had a standing invitation to visit the langdon home and he made it convenient to avail himself of that happiness his was not an unruffled courtship when at last he reached the point of proposing for the daughter of the house neither the daughter nor the household offered any noticeable encouragement to his suit many absurd anecdotes have been told of his first interview with mr langdon on the subject but they are altogether without foundation it was a proper and dignified discussion of a very serious matter mr langdon expressed deep regard for him and friendship but he was not inclined to add him to the family the young lady herself in a general way accorded with these views the applicant for favor left sadly enough but he could not remain discouraged or sad he lectured at cleveland with vast success and the news of it traveled quickly to elmira he was referred to by cleveland papers as a lion and the coming man of the age two days later in pittsburgh november nineteenth he played against fanny kemble the favorite actress of that time with the result that miss kemble had an audience of two hundred against nearly ten times the number who gathered to hear mark twain the news of this went to elmira too it was in the papers there next morning surely this was a conquering hero a gay lochinvar from out of the west and the daughter of the house must be guarded closely that he did not bear her away it was on the second morning following the pittsburgh triumph when the langdon family were gathered at breakfast that a bushy auburn head poked fearfully in at the door and a low humble voice said the calf has returned may the prodigal have some breakfast no one could be reserved or reprovingly distant or any of those unfriendly things with a person like that certainly not jervis langdon who delighted in the humor and the tricks and the turns and oddities of this eccentric visitor giving his daughter to him was another matter but even that thought was less disturbing than it had been at the start in truth the langdon household had somehow grown to feel that he belonged to them the elder sister's husband theodore crane endorsed him fully he had long before read some of the mark twain sketches that had traveled eastward in advance of their author and had recognized even in the crudest of them a classic charm as for olivia langdon's mother and sister their happiness lay in hers where her heart went theirs went also and it would appear that her heart in spite of herself had found its rightful keeper only young langdon was irreconciled and eventually set out for a voyage around the world to escape the situation there was only a provisional engagement at first jervis langdon suggested and samuel clemens agreed with him that it was proper to know something of his past as well as of his present before the official parental sanction should be given when mr langdon inquired as to the names of persons of standing to whom he might write for credentials clemens pretty confidently gave him the name of the rev stebbins and others of san francisco adding that he might write also to joe goodman if he wanted to but that he had lied for goodman a hundred times 
and goodman would lie for him if necessary so his testimony would be of no value the letters to the clergy were written and mr langdon also wrote one on his own account it was a long mail trip to the coast and back in those days it might be two months before replies would come from those ministers the lecturer set out again on his travels and was radiantly and happily busy he went as far west as illinois had crowded houses in chicago visited friends and kindred in hannibal st louis and keokuk carrying the great news and lecturing in old familiar haunts end of chapter sixty nine a lecture tour read by john greenman This is section seventy of Mark Twain, a biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, a biography. Volume one, part two, eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five. Chapter seventy Innocence at Home and the Innocence Abroad. He was in Jacksonville, Illinois, at the end of January, eighteen sixty nine and in a letter to bliss states that he will be in elmira two days later and asks that proofs of the book be sent there he arrived at the langdon home anxious to hear the reports that would make him as the novels might say the happiest or the most miserable of men jervis langdon had a rather solemn look when they were alone together clemens asked you've heard from those gentlemen out there yes and from another gentleman i wrote concerning you they don't appear to have been very enthusiastic from your manner well yes some of them were i suppose i may ask what particular form their emotion took oh yes yes they agree unanimously that you are a brilliant able man a, a man with a future and that you would make about the worst husband on record the applicant for favor had a forlorn look there's nothing very evasive about that he said there was a period of reflective silence it was probably no more than a few seconds but it seemed longer haven't you any other friend that you could suggest langdon said apparently none whose testimony would be valuable jervis langdon held out his hand you have at least one he said i believe in you i know you better than they do and so came the crown of happiness the engagement of samuel langhorn clemens and olivia lewis langdon was ratified next day february fourth eighteen sixty nine but if the friends of mark twain viewed the idea of the marriage with scant favor the friends of miss langdon regarded it with genuine alarm elmira was a conservative place a place of pedigree and family tradition that a stranger a former printer pilot miner wandering journalist and lecturer was to carry off the daughter of one of the oldest and wealthiest families was a thing not to be lightly permitted the fact that he had achieved a national fame did not count against other considerations the social protest amounted almost to insurrection but it was not availing the langdon family had their doubts too though of a different sort their doubts lay in the fear that one reared as their daughter had been might be unable to hold a place as the wife of this intellectual giant whom they felt that the world was preparing to honor that this delicate sheltered girl could have the strength of mind and body for her position seemed hard to believe their faith overbore such questionings and the future years proved how fully it was justified to his mother samuel clemens wrote she is only a little body but she hasn't her peer in christendom i gave her only a plain gold engagement ring when fashion imperatively demands a two hundred dollar diamond one and told her it was typical of her 
future life, namely, that she would have to flourish on substance rather than luxuries. But you see, I know the girl. She don't care anything about luxuries. She spends no money but her astral year's allowance, and spends nearly every cent of that on other people. She will be a good, sensible little wife without any airs about her. I don't make intercession for her beforehand, and ask you to love her, for there isn't any use in that. You couldn't help it if you were to try. I warn you that whoever comes within the fatal influence of her beautiful nature is her willing slave forevermore. To Mrs. Crane, absent in March, her father wrote, Dear Sue, I received your letter yesterday with a great deal of pleasure, but the letter has gone in pursuit of one S. L. Clemens, who has been giving us a great deal of trouble lately. We cannot have a joy in our family without a feeling on the part of the little incorrigible in our family that this wanderer must share it, so as soon as read into her pocket and off upstairs goes your letter and in the next two minutes into the mail, so it is impossible for me now to refer to it, or by reading it over again, an inspiration in writing you. Clemens closed his lecture tour in March and went immediately to Elmira. He had lectured between fifty and sixty times, with a return of something more than eight thousand dollars, not a bad aggregate for a first season on the circuit. He had planned to make a spring tour to California, but the attraction at Elmira was of a sort that discouraged distant travel. Furthermore, he disliked the platform, then and always. It was always a temptation to him because of its quick and abundant return, but it was none the less distasteful. In a letter of that spring he wrote, I most cordially hate the lecture field, and after all I shudder to think I may never get out of it. In all conversation with Goff and Anna Dickinson, Nasby, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Wendell Phillips, and the other old stagers, I could not observe that they ever expected or hoped to get out of the business. I don't want to get wedded to it as they are. He declined further engagements on the excuse that he must attend to getting out his book. The revised proofs were coming now, and he and gentle Livy Langdon read them together. He realized presently that, with her sensitive nature, she had also a keen literary perception. What he lacked in delicacy, and his lack was likely to be large enough in that direction, she detected, and together they pruned it away. She became his editor during those happy courtship days, a position which she held to her death. The world owed a large debt of gratitude to Mark Twain's wife, who, from the very beginning, and always, so far as in her strength she was able, inspired him to give only his worthiest to the world, whether in written or spoken word, in counsel or in deed. Those early days of their close companionship, spiritual and mental, were full of revelation to Samuel Clemens, a revelation that continued from day to day and from year to year, even to the very end. The letter to Bliss and the proofs were full of suggested changes that would refine and beautify the text. In one of them he settles the question of title, which he says is to be The Innocence Abroad, or The New Pilgrim's Progress. And we may be sure that it was Olivia Langdon's voice that gave the deciding vote for the newly adopted chief title which would take any suggestion of irreverence out of the remaining words. 
the book was to have been issued in the spring but during his wanderings proofs had been delayed and there was now considerable anxiety about it as the agencies had become impatient for the canvas at the end of april clemens wrote your printers are doing well i will hurry the proofs but it was not until the early part of june that the last chapters were revised and returned then the big book at last completed went to press on an edition of twenty thousand a large number for any new book even today in later years through some confusion of circumstance mark twain was led to believe that the publication of the innocents abroad was long and unnecessarily delayed but this was manifestly a mistake the book went to press in june it was a big book and a large edition the first copy was delivered july twentieth eighteen sixty nine and four hundred and seventeen bound volumes were shipped that month even with the quicker mechanical processes of today, a month or more is allowed for a large book between the final return of proofs and the date of publication so it is only another instance of his remembering as he once quaintly put it the thing that didn't happen in an article in the north american review september twenty first nineteen o six mr clemens stated that he found it necessary to telegraph notice that he would bring suit if the book was not immediately issued in none of the letters covering this period is there any suggestion of delay on the part of the publishers and the date of the final return of proofs together with the date of publication preclude the possibility of such a circumstance at some point of his life he doubtless sent or contemplated sending such a message and this fact through some curious psychology became confused in his mind with the first edition of the innocents abroad end of chapter seventy innocents at home and the innocents abroad read by john greenman this is section seventy one of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter seventy one the great book of travel the innocents abroad was a success from the start the machinery for its sale and delivery was in full swing by august first and five thousand one hundred and seventy copies were disposed of that month a number that had increased to more than thirty-one thousand by the first of the year it was a book of travel its lowest price was three and a half dollars no such record had been made by a book of that description none has equaled it since editor's note one must recall that this was the record only up to nineteen ten dash d w if mark twain was not already famous he was unquestionably famous now as the author of the new pilgrim's progress he was swept into the domain of letters as one riding at the head of a cavalcade doors and windows wide with welcome and jubilant with applause newspapers chorused their enthusiasm the public voiced universal approval only a few of the more cultured critics seemed hesitant and doubtful they applauded most of them but with reservation dr holland regarded mark twain as a mere fun-maker of ephemeral popularity and was not altogether pleasant in his dictum dr holmes in a letter to the author speaks of the frequently quaint and amusing conceits but does not find it in his heart to refer to the book as literature it was naturally difficult for the east to concede a serious value to one who approached his subject with such militant aboriginality and occasionally wrote those kind william dean howells reviewed the book in the atlantic which was of itself a distinction whether the review was favorable or otherwise it was favorable on the whole favorable to the humor of the book its delicious impudence the charm of its good-natured irony the review closed it is no business of ours to fix his rank among the humorists california has given us but we think he is 
in an entirely different way from all the others quite worthy of the company of the best this is praise but not of an intemperate sort nor very inclusive the descriptive the poetic the more pretentious phrases of the book did not receive attention. Mr. Howells was perhaps the first critic of eminence to recognize in Mark Twain not only the humorist, but the supreme genius, the Lincoln of our literature. This was later. The public, the silent public, with what Howells calls the inspired knowledge of the simple-hearted multitude, reached a similar verdict forthwith and on sufficient evidence let the average unprejudiced person of to-day take up the old volume and read a few chapters anywhere and decide whether it is the work of a mere humanist or also of a philosopher a poet and a seer the writer well remembers a little group of the simple-hearted multitude who during the winter of sixty nine and seventy gathered each evening to hear the innocents read aloud and their unanimous verdict that it was the best book of modern times it was the most daring book of its day passages of it were calculated to take the breath of the orthodox reader only somehow it made him smile too it was all so good-natured so openly sincere without doubt it preached heresy the heresy of viewing revered landmarks and relics joyously rather than lugubriously, reverentially when they inspired reverence, satirically when they invited ridicule, and with kindliness always. The Innocents Abroad is Mark Twain's greatest book of travel. The critical and the pure in speech may object to this verdict. Brander Matthews regards it second to A Tramp Abroad, the natural viewpoint of the literary technician. The Tramp contains better usage without doubt, but it lacks the color which gives the innocence its perennial charm. In the innocence there is a glow, a fragrance, a romance of touch, a subtle something which is idyllic, something which is not quite reality, in the tale of that little company that so long ago sailed away to the harbors of their illusions beyond the sea and wandered together through old palaces and galleries and among the tombs of the saints and down through ancient lands there is an atmosphere about it all a dream-like quality that lies somewhere in the telling maybe or in the tale at all events it is there and the world has felt it ever since Perhaps it could be defined in a single word, perhaps that word would be youth. That the artist, poor True Williams, felt its inspiration is certain. We may believe that Williams was not a great draftsman, but no artist ever caught more perfectly the light and spirit of the author's text. Crude some of the pictures are, no doubt, but they convey the very essence of the story. They belong to it they are part of it and they ought never to perish a tramp abroad is a rare book but it cannot rank with its great predecessor in human charm the public which in the long run makes mistakes has rendered that verdict the innocence by far outsells the tramp and for that matter any other book of travel end of chapter seventy one the great book of travel read by john greenman This is section 72 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 72 The Purchase of a Paper. It is curious to reflect that Mark Twain still did not regard himself as a literary man. He had no literary plans for the future he scarcely looked forward to the publication of another book. He considered himself a journalist. His ambition lay in the direction of retirement in some prosperous newspaper enterprise, with the comforts and companionship of a home. 
during his travels he had already been casting about for a congenial and substantial association in newspaperdom and had at one time considered the purchase of an interest in the cleveland herald but buffalo was nearer elmira and when an opportunity offered by which he could acquire a third interest in the buffalo express for twenty five thousand dollars the purchase was decided upon his lack of funds prompted a new plan for a lecture tour to the pacific coast this time with d r locke nasby then immensely popular in his lecture cussed be canaan clemens had met nasby on the circuit and was very fond of him the two had visited boston together and while there had called on dr holmes this by the way nasby was fond of clemens too but doubtful about the trip doubtful about his lecture your proposition takes my breath away if i had my new lecture completed i wouldn't hesitate a moment but really isn't cussed be canaan too old you know that lemon our african brother juicy as he was in his day has been squeezed dry why howl about his wrongs after said wrongs have been redressed why screech about the damnable spirit of caste when the victim thereof sits at the first table and his oppressor mildly takes in hash what he leaves you see friend twain the fifteenth amendment busted cussed be canaan i howled feelingly on the subject while it was a living issue for i felt all that i said and a great deal more but now that we have won our fight why dance frantically on the dead corpse of our enemy the reliable contraband is contraband no more but a citizen of the united states and i speak of him no more give me a week to think of your proposition if i can jerk a lecture in time i will go with you the lord knows i would like to nasby's lecture cussed be canaan opened we are all descended from grandfathers he had a powerful voice and always just on the stroke of eight he rose and vigorously delivered this sentence once after lecturing an entire season two hundred and twenty-five nights he went home to rest that evening he sat musingly drowsing by the fire when the clock struck eight without a moment's thought nasby sprang to his feet and thundered out we are all descended from grandfathers nasby did not go and clemens enthusiasm cooled at the prospect of setting out alone on that long tour furthermore jervis langdon promptly insisted on advancing the money required to complete the purchase of the express and the trade was closed mr langdon is just as good for twenty five thousand dollars for me and has already advanced half of it in cash i wrote and asked whether i had better send him my note or a due bill or how he would prefer to have the indebtedness made of record and he answered every other topic in the letter pleasantly but never replied to that at all still i shall give my note into a hands of his business agent here and pay him the interest as it falls due s l c to his mother the buffalo express was at this time in the hands of three men colonel george f selkirk j l lamed and thomas a kennett Colonel Selkirk was business manager. Lamed was political editor. With the purchase of Kennett's share, Clemens became a sort of general and contributing editor, with a more or less roving commission, his hours and duties not very clearly defined. It was believed by his associates, and by Clemens himself, that his known connection with the paper would give it prestige and circulation, as Nasby's connection had popularized the Toledo Blade the new editor entered upon his duties august fourteenth eighteen sixty nine the members of the buffalo press gave him a dinner that evening and after the manner of newspaper men the world over were handsomely cordial to the new enemy in their midst 
there is an anecdote which relates that next morning when mark twain arrived in the express office it was then at fourteen swan street there happened to be no one present who knew him a young man rose very brusquely and asked if there was any one he would like to see it is reported that he replied with gentle deliberation well yes i should like to see some young man offer the new editor a chair it is so like mark twain that we are inclined to accept it though it seems of doubtful circumstance in any case it deserves to be true his salutatory august eighteenth is sufficiently genuine being a stranger it would be immodest for me to suddenly and violently assume the associate editorship of the buffalo express without a single word of comfort or encouragement to the unoffending patrons of the paper who are about to be exposed to constant attacks of my wisdom and learning but the word shall be as brief as possible i only want to assure parties having a friendly interest in the prosperity of the journal that i am not going to hurt the paper deliberately and intentionally at any time i am not going to introduce any startling reforms nor in any way attempt to make trouble i shall not make use of slang and vulgarity upon any occasion or under any circumstances and shall never use profanity except when discussing house rent and taxes indeed upon a second thought i shall not use it even then for it is unchristian inelegant and degrading though to speak truly i do not see how house rent and taxes are going to be discussed worth a cent without it i shall not often meddle with politics because we have a political editor who is already excellent and only needs to serve a term or two in the penitentiary to be perfect i shall not write any poetry unless i conceive a spite against the subscribers such is my platform i do not see any use in it but custom is law and must be obeyed john harrison mills who was connected with the express in those days has written i cannot remember that there was any delay in getting down to his work i think within five minutes the new editor had assumed the easy look of one entirely at home pencil in hand and a clutch of paper before him with an air of preoccupation as of one intent on a task delayed it was impossible to be conscious of the man sitting there and not feel his identity with all that he had enjoyed and the reminiscence of it that he seemed to radiate for the personality was so absolutely in accord with all the record of himself and his work i cannot say he seemed to be that vague thing they call a type in race or blood though the word if used in his case for temperament would decidedly mean what they used to call the sanguine i thought that pictorially the noble costume of the albanian would have well become him or he might have been a goth and worn the horned bull pate helmet of alaric's warriors or stood at the prow of one of the swift craft of the vikings his eyes which have been variously described were it seemed to me of an indescribable depth of the bluish moss agate with a capacity of pupil dilation that in certain lights had the effect of a deep black mr mills adds that in dress he was now well groomed 
and that consequently they were obliged to revise their notions as to the careless negligee which gossip had reported from unpublished reminiscences kindly lent to the author by mr mills end of chapter seventy two the purchase of a paper read by john greenman this is section seventy three of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter seventy three the first meeting with howells clemens first period of editorial work was a brief one though he made frequent contributions to the paper sketches squibs travel notes and experiences usually humorous in character his wedding day had been set for early in the year and it was necessary to accumulate a bank account for that occasion before october he was out on the lecture circuit billed now for the first time for new england nervous and apprehensive in consequence though with good hope to pamela he wrote november ninth to-morrow night i appear for the first time before a boston audience four thousand critics and on the success of this matter depends my future success in new england but i am not distressed nasby is in the same boat to-night decides the fate of his brand new lecture he has just left my room been reading his lecture to me was greatly depressed i have convinced him that he has little to fear whatever alarm mark twain may have felt was not warranted his success with the new england public was immediate and complete he made his headquarters in boston at redpath's office where there was pretty sure to be congenial company of which he was presently the center it was during one of these boston sojourns that he first met william dean howells his future friend and literary counselor howells was the assistant editor of the atlantic at this time james t fields its editor clemens had been gratified by the atlantic review and had called to express his thanks for it he sat talking to fields when howells entered the editorial rooms and on being presented to the author of the review delivered his appreciation in the form of a story sufficiently appropriate but not qualified for the larger types he said when i read that review of yours i felt like the woman who was so glad her baby had come light his manner his humor his quaint colloquial forms all delighted howells more in fact than the opulent sealskin overcoat which he affected at this period a garment astonishing rather than aesthetic as mark twain's clothes in those days of his first regeneration were likely to be startling enough we may believe in the conservative atmosphere of the atlantic rooms and howells gentle genial sincere filled with the early happiness of his calling won the heart of mark twain and never lost it and what is still more notable won his absolute and unvarying confidence in all literary affairs it was always mark twain's habit to rely on somebody and in matters pertaining to literature and to literary people in general he laid his burden on william dean howells from that day only a few weeks after that first visit we find him telegraphing to howells asking him to look after a californian poet then ill and friendless in brooklyn clemens states that he does not know the poet but will contribute fifty dollars if howells will petition the steamboat company for a pass and no doubt howells complied and spent a good deal more than fifty dollars worth of time to get the poet relieved and started it would be like him end of chapter seventy three the first meeting with howells read by john greenman this is section seventy four of mark twain a biography 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography. Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 74 The Wedding Day. The wedding was planned at first, either for Christmas or New Year's Day but as the lecture engagements continued into january it was decided to wait until these were filled february second a date near the anniversary of the engagement was agreed upon also a quiet wedding with no tour the young people would go immediately to buffalo and take up a modest residence in a boarding-house as comfortable even as luxurious as the husband's financial situation justified at least that was samuel clemens understanding of the matter he felt that he was heavily in debt that his first duty was to relieve himself of that obligation there were other plans in elmira but in the daily and happy letters he received there was no inkling of any new purpose he wrote to j d f slee of buffalo who was associated in business with mr langdon and asked him to find a suitable boarding place one that would be sufficiently refined for the woman who was to be his wife, and sufficiently reasonable to ensure prosperity. In due time Slee replied that, while boarding was a miserable business anyhow, he had been particularly fortunate in securing a place on one of the most pleasant streets, the family a small one, and choice spirits, with no predilection for taking boarders, and consenting to the present arrangement only because of the anticipated pleasure of your company the price slee added would be reasonable as a matter of fact a house on delaware avenue still the fine residence street of buffalo had been bought and furnished throughout as a present to the bride and groom it stands today practically unchanged brick and mansard without east lake within a type then much in vogue spacious and handsome for that period it was completely appointed diagrams of the rooms had been sent to elmira and miss langdon herself had selected the furnishings everything was put in readiness including linen cutlery and utensils even the servants had been engaged and the pantry and cellar had been stocked it must have been hard for olivia langdon to keep this wonderful surprise out of those daily letters a surprise like that is always watching a chance to slip out unawares especially when one is eagerly impatient to reveal it however the traveller remained completely in the dark he may have wondered vaguely at the lack of enthusiasm in the boarding idea and could he have been certain that the sales of the book would continue or that his newspaper venture would yield an abundant harvest he might have planned his domestic beginning on a more elaborate scale if only the tennessee land would yield the long-expected fortune now but these were all incalculable things all that he could be sure of was the coming of his great happiness in whatever environment and of the dragging weeks between at last the night of the final lecture came and he was off for elmira with the smallest possible delay once there the intervening days did not matter he could join in the busy preparations he could write exuberantly to his friends to laura hawkins long since laura fraser he sent a playful line to jim gillis still digging and washing on the slopes of the old tuolumne hills he wrote a letter which eminently belongs here elmira new york january twenty sixth eighteen seventy dear jim i remember that old night just as well and somewhere among my relics i have your remembrance stored away it makes my heart ache yet to call to mind some of those days still it shouldn't for right in the depths of their poverty and their pocket hunting vagabondage lay the germ of my coming good fortune you remember the one gleam of jollity that shot across our dismal sojourn in the rain and mud of angel's camp i mean that day we sat around 
the tavern stove and heard that chap tell about the frog and how they filled him with shot and you remember how we quoted from the yarn and laughed over it out there on the hillside while you and dear old stoker panned and washed i jotted the story down in my notebook that day and would have been glad to get ten or fifteen dollars for it i was just that blind but then we were so hard up i published that story and it became widely known in america india china england and the reputation it made for me has paid me thousands and thousands of dollars since four or five months ago i bought into the express i have ordered it sent to you as long as you live and if the bookkeeper sends you any bills you let me hear of it i went heavily in debt never could have dared to do that jim if we hadn't heard the jumping frog story that day and wouldn't i love to take old stoker by the hand and wouldn't i love to see him in his great specialty his wonderful rendition of rinalds in the burning shame where is dick and what is he doing give him my fervent love and warm old remembrances a week from today i shall be married to a girl even better and lovelier than the peerless chaparral quails you can't come so far jim but still i cordially invite you to come anyhow and i invite dick too and if you two boys were to land here on that pleasant occasion we would make you right royally welcome truly your friend samuel l clemens p s california plums are good jim particularly when they are stewed it had only been five years before that day in angel's camp but how long ago and how far away it seemed to him now so much had happened since then so much of which that was the beginning so little compared with the marvel of the years ahead whose threshold he was now about to cross and not alone a day or two before the wedding he was asked to lecture on the night of february second he replied that he was sorry to disappoint the applicant but that he could not lecture on the night of february second for the reason that he was going to marry a young lady on that evening and that he would rather marry that young lady than deliver all the lectures in the world and so came the wedding day it began pleasantly the postman brought a royalty check that morning of four thousand dollars the accumulation of three months sales and the reverend joseph twichell and harmony his wife came from hartford twichell to join with the reverend thomas k beecher in solemnizing the marriage pamela moffat a widow now with her daughter annie grown to a young lady had come all the way from st louis and mrs fairbanks from cleveland yet the guests were not numerous not more than a hundred at most so it was a quiet wedding there in the langdon parlors those dim stately rooms that in the future would hold so much of his history so much of the story of life and death that made its beginning there the wedding service was about seven o'clock for mr beecher had a meeting at the church soon after that hour afterward followed the wedding supper and dancing and the bride's father danced with the bride to the interested crowd awaiting him at the church mr beecher reported that the bride was very beautiful and had on the longest white gloves he had ever seen he declared they reached to her shoulders perhaps for a younger generation it should be said that 
Thomas K. Beecher was a brother of Henry Ward Beecher. He lived and died in Elmira, the almost worshipped pastor of the Park Congregational Church. He was a noble unorthodox teacher. Samuel Clemens, at the time of his marriage, already strongly admired him, and had espoused his cause in an article signed Escat in the Elmira Advertiser, when he, Beecher, had been assailed by the more orthodox Elmira clergy. For the Escat article, see Appendix I, at the end of last volume. It was the next afternoon when they set out for Buffalo, accompanied by the bride's parents, the groom's relatives, the Beechers, and perhaps one or two others of that happy company. It was nine o'clock at night when they arrived, and found Mr. Slee waiting at the station with sleighs to convey the party to the boarding-house he had selected. They drove and drove, and the sleigh containing the bride and groom got behind, and apparently was bound nowhere in particular, which disturbed the groom a good deal, for he thought it proper that they should arrive first to receive their guests. He commented on Slee's poor judgment in selecting a house that was so hard to find, and when at length they turned into fashionable Delaware Avenue and stopped before one of the most attractive places in the neighborhood, he was beset with fear concerning the richness of the locality. They were on the steps when the doors opened, and a perfect fairyland of lights and decoration was revealed within. The friends who had gone ahead came out with greetings to lead in the bride and groom. Servants hurried forward to take bags and wraps. They were ushered inside. They were led through beautiful rooms, all newly appointed and garnished. The bridegroom was dazed, unable to understand the meaning of things, the apparent ownership and completeness of possession. At last the young wife put her hand upon his arm. "'Don't you—' understand youth she said that was always her name for him don't you understand it is ours all ours everything a gift from father but even then he could not grasp it not at first not until mr langdon brought a little box and opening it handed them the deeds nobody quite remembers what was the first remark that samuel clemens made then but either then or a little later he said, Mr. Langdon, whenever you are in Buffalo, if it's twice a year, come right here, bring your bag, and stay overnight if you want to. It shan't cost you a cent. They went into supper then, and by and by the guests were gone, and the young wedded pair were alone. Patrick McAleer, the young coachman who would grow old in their employ, and Ellen, the cook, came in for their morning orders, and were full of Irish delight at the inexperience and novelty of it all. Then they were gone, and only the lovers in their new house and their new happiness remained. And so it was they entered the enchanted land. End of chapter 74 The Wedding Day Read by John Greenman This is section 75 of Mark Twain, A Biography. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain, A Biography, Volume 1, Part 2, 1866 to 1875. Chapter 75, As to Destiny. If any reader has followed these chapters thus far, he may have wondered, even if vaguely, at the seeming fatality of events. Mark Twain had but to review his own life for justification of his doctrine of inevitability, an unbroken and immutable sequence of cause and effect from the beginning. Once he said, When the first living atom found itself afloat on the great Laurentian Sea, the first act of that first atom led to the second act of that first atom, and so on down through the succeeding ages of all life, until, if the steps could be traced, 
it would be shown that the first act of that first atom has led inevitably to the act of my standing here in my dressing gown at this instant talking to you it seemed the clearest presentiment ever offered in the matter of predestined circumstance predestined from the instant when that primal atom felt the vital thrill mark twain's early life however imperfectly recorded exemplifies this postulate if through the years still ahead of us the course of destiny seems less clearly defined it is only because thronging events make the threads less easy to trace the web becomes richer the pattern more intricate and confusing but the line of fate neither breaks nor falters to the end end of chapter seventy five as to destiny read by john greenman this is section seventy six of mark twain a biography this librivox recording is in the public domain mark twain a biography volume one part two eighteen sixty six to eighteen seventy five chapter seventy six on the buffalo express with the beginning of life in buffalo mark twain had become already a world character a man of large consequence and events he had no proper realization of this no real sense of the size of his conquest he still regarded himself merely as a lecturer and journalist temporarily popular but with no warrant to a permanent seat in the world's literary congress he thought his success something of an accident the fact that he was prepared to settle down as an editorial contributor to a newspaper in what was then only a big village is the best evidence of a modest estimate of his talents he worked like a horse is the verdict of those who were closely associated with him on the express his hours were not regular but they were long often he was at his desk at eight in the morning and remained there until ten or eleven at night his working costume was suited to comfort rather than show with coat vest collar and tie usually removed sometimes even his shoes he lounged in his chair in an attitude that afforded the larger ease pulling over the exchanges scribbling paragraphs editorials humorous skits and what not as the notion came upon him j l lamed his co-worker he sat on the opposite side of the same table remembers that mark twain enjoyed his work as he went along the humor of it and that he frequently laughed as some whimsicality or new absurdity came into his mind i doubt writes lamed if he ever enjoyed anything more than the jackknife engraving that he did on a piece of board of a military map of the siege of paris which was printed in the express from his original plate with accompanying explanations and comments his half-day of whittling and laughter that went with it are something that i find pleasant to remember indeed my whole experience of association with him is a happy memory which i am fortunate in having what one saw of him was always the actual mark twain acting out of his own nature simply frankly without pretense and almost without reserve it was that simplicity and naturalness in the man which carried his greatest charm lamed like many others likens mark twain to lincoln in various of his characteristics the two worked harmoniously together lamed attending to the political direction of the journal clemens to the literary and what might be termed the sentimental side there was no friction in the division of labor never anything but good feeling between them clemens had a poor opinion of his own comprehension of politics and perhaps as little regard for lamed's conception of humor once when the latter attempted something in the way of pleasantry his associate said better leave the humor on this paper to me lamed and once when lamed was away attending the republican state convention at saratoga 
and some editorial comment seemed necessary, Clemens thought it best to sign the utterance and to make humor of his shortcomings. I do not know much about politics and am not sitting up nights to learn. I am satisfied that these nominations are all right and sound, and that they are the only ones that can bring peace to our distracted country. The only political phrase I am perfectly familiar with and competent to hurl at the public with fearless confidence. The other editor is full of them. But being merely satisfied is not enough. I always like to know before I shout. But I go for Mr. Curtis with all my strength. Being certain of him, I hereby shout all I know how. But the others may be a split ticket, or a scratched ticket, or whatever you call it. I will let it alone for the present. It will keep. The other young man will be back tomorrow, and he will shout for it, split or no split, rest assured of that. He will prance into this political ring with his tomahawk and his war whoop, and then you will hear a crash and see the scalps fly. He has none of my diffidence. He knows all about these nominees, and if he don't he will let on to in such a natural way as to deceive the most critical. He knows everything. He knows more than Webster's Unabridged and the American Encyclopedia, but whether he knows anything about a subject or not, he is perfectly willing to discuss it. When he gets back he will tell you all about these candidates as serenely as if he had been acquainted with them a hundred years, though, speaking confidentially, I doubt if he ever heard of any of them till today. I am right well satisfied it is a good, sound, sensible ticket, and a ticket to win, but wait till he comes. In the meantime, I go for George William Curtis and take the chances. Mark Twain He had become what Mr. Howells calls entirely de-southernized by this time. From having been of slave-holding stock and a Confederate soldier, he had become a most positive Republican, a rampant abolitionist, had there been anything left to abolish. His sympathy had been always with the oppressed, and he had now become their defender. His work on the paper revealed this more and more. He wrote fewer sketches and more editorials, and the editorials were likely to be either savage assaults upon some human abuse, or fierce espousals of the weak. They were fearless, scathing, terrific. Of some farmers of Cohocton who had taken the law into their own hands to punish a couple whom they believed to be a detriment to the community, he wrote, The men who did that deed are capable of doing any low, sneaking, cowardly villainy that could be invented in perdition. They are the very bastards of the devil." He appended a full list of their names, and added, "'If the farmers of Cohocton are of this complexion, what on earth must a Cohocton rough be like?' But all this happened a long time ago, and we need not detail those various old interests and labors here. It is enough to say that Mark Twain on the Express was what he had been from the beginning, and would be to the end, the zealous champion of justice and liberty, violent and sometimes wrong in his viewpoint, but never less than fearless and sincere. 
invariably he was for the oppressed he had a natural instinct for the right but right or wrong he was for the underdog among the best of his editorial contributions is a tribute to anson burlingame who died february twenty third eighteen seventy at st petersburg on his trip around the world as special ambassador for the chinese empire in this editorial clemens endeavored to pay something of his debt to the noble statesman he reviewed burlingame's astonishing career the career which had closed at forty-seven and read like a fairy tale and he dwelt lovingly on his hero's nobility of character at the close he said he was a good man and a very very great man america lost a son and all the world a servant when he died among those early contributions to the express is a series called around the world an attempt at collaboration with professor d r ford who did the actual traveling while mark twain writing in the first person gave the letters his literary stamp at least some of the contributions were written in this way such as adventures in haiti the pacific and japan these letters exist today only in the old files of the express and indeed this is the case with most of clemens work for that paper it was mainly ephemeral or timely work and its larger value has disappeared here and there is a sentence worth remembering of two practical jokers who sent in a marriage notice of persons not even contemplating matrimony he said this deceit has been practiced maliciously by a couple of men whose small souls will escape through their pores some day if they do not varnish their hides some of the sketches have been preserved journalism in tennessee one of the best of his wilder burlesques is as enjoyable today as when written a curious dream made a lasting impression on his buffalo readers and you are pretty certain to hear of it when you mention mark twain in that city today it vividly called attention to the neglect of the old north street graveyard the gruesome vision of the ancestors deserting with their coffins on their backs was even more humiliating than amusing and inspired a movement for reform it has been effective elsewhere since then and may still be read with profit or satisfaction for in a note at the end the reader is assured that if the cemeteries of his town are kept in good order the dream is not leveled at his town at all but particularly and venomously at the next town end of chapter seventy six on the buffalo express read by john greenman